Hello, I'm Dr. Klosser, and today I'm going to be telling you about one of my favorite areas of chemistry, which is computational chemistry. Most of the information I'm going to go over in this video can also be found on your lab handout, and you may also want to consult some of your lecture materials for additional background information. So computational chemistry is a relatively new area of chemistry, and it's a very active area of research where mathematical models are implemented on computers and used to better understand chemical processes. Some uses of computational chemistry are to model things that you can't observe experimentally, and also to actually understand the results of experiments. Computational chemistry lets us see things on a much smaller scale than we might be able to in a lab context. We can kind of split computational chemistry into two main areas. One of those is quantum chemistry methods, where we're solving the Schrodinger equation. And I'll talk more about the Schrodinger equation in just a second. The other broad area of computational chemistry is based on classical physics or classical mechanics, and is generally known as molecular mechanics. In this area, uh, of computational chemistry, we treat the atoms just as classical masses, and they're attached to springs. We can also talk about different areas of computational chemistry that are based purely on mathematics and physics, and those are known as ab initio methods. And ab initio is Latin for from the beginning. And then there are also methods that do rely on some experimental data, and those are typically known as empirical methods. In this lab, you're going to be using ab initio methods, so methods really based on the mathematics and physics, and you're going to be solving the Schrodinger equation, or rather you're actually going to be telling the computer how to solve the Schrodinger equation. So just to give you a little bit of a sense of, of this area of chemistry, um, many of the theoretical ideas were developed about 100 years ago in the 1920s. And those were around for quite a while before computers became fast enough and readily available enough in the 1980s that research in this field could really take off. And so it's still a very active area of research today. Um, so coming back to this Schrodinger equation, the Schrodinger equation can be solved exactly only for some very specific one electron systems. One of those is the hydrogen atom. The solutions when you solve this equation, you get the wave functions, which tell you about the orbitals or where the electrons are around the atoms and the energy of those, those electrons. So in this lab, we're going to be using a program which approximately solves the Schrodinger equation using a method that's known as the self-consistent field method. So before we get to the approximate solutions, though, I want to remind you a little bit about the exactly solvable model, which is the hydrogen atom. So when you solve the Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom, you actually get a lot of different solutions out. The lowest energy solution is what's known as the ground state, and higher energy solutions are going to be the excited states. So we know from experiment that the hydrogen atom energy levels are proportional to 1 over n squared, where n is an integer. And these are negative values. So the lowest energy solution is going to be when n equals 1. And then they get less negative as n gets larger. These different solutions, which have different energies, correspond to different wave functions. And those wave functions or orbitals can be described by three quantum numbers. So the three quantum numbers are n, which tells us about the size of the orbital, l, which tells us about the shape, and m sub l, which tells us about the orientation. So the principal quantum number n is what tells us about the energy.
for a hydrogen atom, that's all you need to tell you about the energy. And each n value can be split into different sublevels. So in general, for each n, there are n minus 1 possible L values that determine the shape of the orbital. And then m sub L ranges from negative L to L. So the lowest energy solution is going to have n equals 1. Again, it's the most negative. The shape is L equals 0, which is also given the letter S. So in chemistry, L equals 0 is also represented by the letter S. I remember this as it's a spherical wave function. Um, and there's only one of those. So there's only one possible L value, which is also zero. In the N equals two levels, we can now have either L equal to zero or L equal to one. When L is equal to zero, we again have a spherical orbital. There's only one way to have a sphere. And we also have L equals one, where we have this peanut shaped orbital. And here there's three different ways to orient it. We can orient it around the X, Y, or Z axis. And so there's three possible values of M sub L, which is M sub L is negative one, zero, or one. When we get up to the N equals three level, we can have additional angular momentum and magnetic quantum numbers. And again, we're gonna have the S and the P orbitals but now we have a new set, which are d orbitals. So these wave functions or orbitals can also be described by the nodes. Nodes are regions where there's zero probability of finding an electron and are directly related to the energy of the orbitals. There's two types of nodes. There's radial nodes, which describe areas where the wave function changes sign as you move out from the center of an atom. And then there's angular nodes, which are related to the shape of the orbital. So the total number of nodes is always equal to n minus 1. The angular nodes are always going to be equal to the L value. So for an s orbital, which is spherical, there's going to be zero angular nodes. For a p orbital, we have one angular node. A d orbital would have two. And then the radial nodes, the easiest way to determine those is to just take the difference of the total nodes minus the angular nodes. And in the lab, you'll be looking at nodes for some orbitals to determine sort of what the quantum numbers of those orbitals are. So although the hydrogen atom is the only one that we can solve exactly, in general, all atomic orbitals very closely resemble the orbitals for the hydrogen atoms. So we can classify those in the same way with the S, P, and D shapes, as well as the number of radial nodes. In many electron atoms, we do need to be careful to remember that the energy doesn't just depend on the principal quantum number like it does in the hydrogen atom, but it also depends on the shape. And so the s orbitals are always going to be lower in energy than their corresponding p orbitals. And the p orbitals are always going to be lower in energy than the corresponding d orbitals. But it's not necessarily just a straight increase in terms of the principal quantum number because you have these, these offsets. So how do we go about solving the Schrodinger equation approximately? That's what we're going to talk about next. Um, so the way that we do this in practice is by introducing this concept of a basis set. And a basis set is just some set of known functions that are used to describe unknown functions. So in computational chemistry, um, the basis functions are then optimized to approximate the unknown function. So a way of thinking about this is that if we assume I had the shape of a dog, which is our unknown function that I want to approximate. And I'm going to use a basis set of circles to approximate that. I could do it like this. That's not going to be a super good description of the dog. But if I add more circles of different sizes, I can get a better description. 
and an even better description if I, if I add more. And so we can see that when we take away that outline, only this last one actually gives us that shape of the dog bag. But the idea here is that we're using these known functions, which are the circles, to approximate that unknown function. In principle, I could have used any shape. I didn't need to pick circles. I could have done it with squares or diamonds or pentagons. So in principle, any large enough basis is going to give you the same results. Technically, we could get to the exact result if we had an infinite number of functions, but generally that's not, not feasible. Um, so the general rule is that bigger basis sets are going to give us better results. And the again, the unknown functions we want to approximate are these orbitals. The known functions that we're going to use as our basis set are called Gaussian functions. So in one dimension, a Gaussian function just looks like a bell curve. In chemistry, we're actually using three-dimensional Gaussian functions. And they're not exactly the same as the hydrogen orbitals. But because they're so much more efficient, we can just use lots of them to describe our unknown functions. The way that, that we use these basis functions is we do something called the self-consistent field method. And that's used to sort of optimize the basis functions to fit our unknown function. And so what we have to give the computer is information about what atoms we're using and what basis set we want to use. And then we give the computer additional information about how we want to do the proximate calculation. So we guess some wave function um, and calculate the energy. And then basically we use that wave function to update. So we use that guess wave function to solve for an updated wave function and energy and basically go around in circles until the energy doesn't change anymore. Computers are really good at solving this type of problem. Um, and so we don't want to do it by hand, but we want to make use of the computer. So the self-consistent field method that I just told you about for optimizing the basis functions to fit an unknown function is often referred to as an average or a mean field approximation. So what that means is that each electron is effectively surrounded by an average of all the other electrons. A better description of the wave function would take into account the fact that the electrons can see each other. So I like to think about this as driving down the highway using a, a traffic map. So, in, so you might see an area where it's all green and there you're just gonna drive the speed limit and hopefully that's, that's good. And then you might hit a yellow section or a red section where the traffic's moving slower so you can adjust your speed accordingly. But we know that that's not really gonna be a good idea. In reality, you need to know exactly where the other cars are. You can't just look at the average you need. So it's the same idea here. Um, most methods for accounting for these extra electron interactions are pretty intensive computationally. But one that is very commonly used to at least recover some of these effects is a method called density functional theory. So I'm not going to go into any details about how density functional theory works, but it's still an approximate solution of the Schrodinger equation. And there's lots of different flavors of DFT, which kind of incorporate these interactions in slightly different ways. So the method that you're going to be using in this lab is B3LIP, which is very commonly used. And the name for this, this functional stands for Becky, Lee, Yang, and Parr, who are the people that came up with it. And it also incorporates a couple of experimental parameters. So there's lots of these different functionals. In this lab, we're gonna be just choosing one of them. So the idea is that it's gonna be a little bit better than this average field, but not quite as good as reality.